The next talk will be Paul Chapman, uh, who is an infectious disease physician at Metro North and the Clinical Educator of the Year of Metro North two years ago. Paul's research interests are in general uh, and topic uh, interests are uh, tropical diseases, infectious diseases. Paul is a PhD student at QIMR, uh, where his research has developed an attention uh, an attenuated hookworm vaccine, which has which he has completed a phase one human study on. Is that correct? That's correct, Jeff. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess we're all probably feeling a bit attenuated right now. You're going to talk about the pimple, huh? Yeah, this is all about poo. It's a, fecal, yeah. fecal microbiota fecal transplant. Microbiota transplant. Good. Um, so, it's great to be here and thanks to the organisers for inviting me to um, certainly the most exciting, uh, the exciting field in therapeutics, I think, at present. Um, so, um, I've got no disclosures. So, this is going to be a tag team session. Um, I'm going to talk to for about 10 minutes um, and uh, quickly um, address the question before us, which is should we expand um, fecal microbiotic uh, transplant? Um, and I'll try and frame that, obviously, in this context to antibiotic resistance and multi-resistant organisms. Then I'll hand over to my esteemed colleague, uh, Michael Thomas, who's going to fill us in a little bit on um, uh, the Red Cross's um, work in um, producing a, a semi-GMP grade um, FMT product, uh, which we can use, uh, which is highly relevant now that the therapeutic um, the TGA has, um, has, has made some rulings. But Michael will fill you in on, fill you in on that. So um, I did a, a quick and, um, and very dirty um, review of all the prospective published trials since 2013. And you can see that um, there's almost 500 uh, particip participants have been randomized to FMT just for Clostridium difficile alone. And if you add in the other uh, indications, which are very variable, um, we're up to 700 patients. And then if you add in the non-randomized studies, we get well over a thousand patients randomized, um, sorry, uh, um, uh, given FMT for various different indications uh, within the last six years. So FMT is actually, um, uh, it is expanding. And, and so we're gonna focus on uh, the antimicrobial resistance um, uh, features of it. And this is really only the um, published studies. So those of you who listen to Triple J here will, um, will uh, remember or may remember the um, documentary um, by Ange McCormack and Tom Tilley documenting um, Dave Haskin's plight who suffered from a mystery illness in 2011. Um, after bouncing around various medical uh, practitioners eventually ended up getting fecal microbiota transplantation for chron uh, colonic, chronic colonic dysbiosis. And um, he was doing this every day, essentially using donations from his family and friends, preparing them in his backyard and administering them by enema himself. And to facilitate his um, rock star kind of uh, jet setting lifestyle, he did a letterbox drop, found someone uh, called Harry, who is, uh, uh, this is Harry clearly, um, who is happy to be a, uh, uh, a donor for him. Uh, and he became the poo roadie who accompanied Dave Hosking uh, to Nashville where they recorded their latest album, Suck on Light. So it's totally in the mainstream and, and the community accepts FMT as a reasonable, uh, as a reasonable therapeutic option. Um, so, I don't want to rehash um, San Marie's talk too much. Um, I'm a clinician, so this is going to be much, much more simplified. Um, but we know that the human body, in the human body, um, bacterial cells outnumber mammalian cells by about 1.3 to 1. And the vast majority of these organisms live in our colon uh, at a concentration of 10 to the 11 bacteria per mil, and your average colon with a capacitance of about 400 mils. And if you take these organisms, and, and all of these organisms may have their own antibiotic resistance profile, this antibiotic resistance profile forms our endogenous uh, fecal antibiotic resistome. Um, and San Marie's already talked about dysbiosis. We know that the fecal microbiome is fantastically complex um, and is composed of uh, somewhere between 150 and 400 different species of uh, bacteria. Um, and each individual has their own, uh, their own fingerprint, if you like, or, or poo print, perhaps. 
Um, we also know that there, there are elements of health that are conserved across the species, um, which suggests that the composition of your bowel flora is of evolutionary importance. And we also know that we can change your microbiota by applying some kind of pressure to it. So we can give you some antibiotics, we can change your diet, we can go on a gap year holiday to India, um, and we've got an excellent model of dysbiosis, which is, um, which is cl relapsing Clostridium uh, difficile infection. Um, so in this study, um, uh, in this graphic that you're looking at is of um, 11 patients with relapsing uh, uh, Clostridium difficile infection who were treated with faecal microbial transplant with matched donors. So there's 11 participants and 11 donors. In this graphic, um, <clears throat> each, column uh, each column here um, uh, signifies an individual person's fecal metagenome, and the colors indicate the relative composition of the phyla making up that metagenome. And you can see in the first group, uh, which is on your left, the BFT column, which is the uh, relapsing Clostridium difficile patients before transplant, um, the color is dominated by blue, uh, which corresponds to proteobacteria, um, the dominant species of E. coli and Klebsiella. And we know, that, um, we know that this is important, and our colleagues from the Alfred have shown us that if you're admitted to intensive care and um, Klebsiella is cultured from your rectal swabs, you're seven times more likely to suffer from an infection from that organism uh, than if you, if you didn't have this organism present. If you compare the color scale there of before transplantation to the donors, you can see that in health, our normal microbiome is made up out of the, the greens and reds, so the Firmicutes and the Bacteroidetes, and that we can restore that balance uh, with fecal microbial transplant. So in the same study, uh, they used uh, metagenomics again to look for antibiotic resistance genes within those participants' poo. And in this graph, you can see um, uh, on the y-axis is the number of antibiotic resistance genes um, isolated from the, from the feces. Um, on the x-axis, the first column are the donors. And you can see that the donors had an average of 3.4 um, antibiotic resistance genes isolated from their feces. The BFT group, so the uh, big, <laughs> so the um, before fecal transplant group, um, had an average of 34 antibiotic resistance genes isolated in their feces. And you can see that following uh, fecal transplant at various time points, one, two, and three, um, that the uh, following transplant and engraftment of that fecal transplant, the antibiotic resistance genes uh, have reduced and that that reduction is um, uh, stable over time. So time point three here in some, uh, in some of those participants is out to a, a complete year. So we've certainly shown that the composition of your bowel microbiota is important. We've also shown that we can adjust that with fecal microbi micro microbiota transplantation. And we've shown that we can alter your resistome using fecal microbiota transplantation. So what are the clinical applications of FMT for multi-resistant organisms and antibiotic resistance? Well, there's been um, several uh, prospective and, uh, and retrospective case series published of um, uh, fecal microbial transplantation for MROs. And there's certainly tantalizing uh, results. You can see Belinsky's study there of 20 hematological patients the majority of these, so 40% of these patients were neutropenic and uh, colonized with NDM1 and KPC producing organisms. So these patients, if they get sick from that, their chance of death is you know, 40 or 50%. And after fecal microbiota transplantation over eight weeks, these organisms couldn't be found in these patients with a 75% 75, 75 success rate. So this is tantalizing, but they're uncontrolled studies. There's been no randomized controlled studies to date using this technology. Um, the pleasing thing is on, on clinicaltrials.gov, there are 18, um, 18 studies registered at this time, including a couple of phase one RCTs and a phase two RCT as well, using FMT specifically for eradication of carbapenem uh, producing Enterobacteriaceae. Alas, none of these are registered in Australia for uh, enrolment. And <clears throat> I wonder if we're missing an opportunity to, uh, to intervene. We are um, 
We are a, uh, an island of low antibiotic resistance surrounded by a wall of, of um, neighbours where, where um, uh, antibiotic failure and, um, and um, uh, untreatable infection has become uh, a normal reality of every day. And we've really got an opportunity in Australia to get on the ground floor and produce an export market for not only coal, but um, our faeces. And uh, wouldn't that be nice to, uh, to come up with a new export? Um, and I can certainly imagine a utopia where, along with every stem cell transplant that we send from the raw Brisbane to our various recipients across the world, we send with it a couple of pots of our poo, just <laughs> metagenomically, rationally matched to the receiver's um, dysbiosis. Um, to reduce their graft versus host disease, reduce their risk of bacteremia, and uh, ensure that all of their febrile neutropenia can be treated with ampicillin. Um, so we arrive sort of back at the start, really, with should we expand the use of FMT, um, and in this context, for antibiotic resistance and uh, multi-resistant organisms? And I would say yes, of course, so long as the data supports it. And for that, we really need randomized controlled trials. And for that, we really need uh, easy access to a well-characterized um, uh, transplant um, investigational pro uh, product. And my colleague here, Michael, is going to uh, bring us up to date on the implication of the TGA's uh, ruling on, on FMT and also on uh, the Red Cross's process towards that. So if I can welcome Michael Thomas. He's a microbiologist uh, from the Red Cross. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, I should point out that Paul had the whole session allocated to himself and very generously offered to let me share it with him. So thank you, Paul. Um, and thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to present this. This is gonna be a fairly brief talk. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes, um, but if anyone has questions or anything afterwards, I'll be around for a bit. If you wanna talk about it, there's a lot to talk about. So I just wanna acknowledge first that you funded this. Uh, Australian governments through your tax money fund the Australian Red Cross Blood Service. And so this is what we exist for. So you may ask yourself, what on earth is the blood service interested in feces for? We're trying to get away from the word poo. Unfortunately, we made a, an announcement which was picked up in a WA newspaper in September, and they went with poo, of course, to get an attention-grabbing headline. We're trying to get away from that kind of terminology and um, get it more into the serious realm of an actual therapeutic. So in August, we had a pilot project approved by our board, by both the Red Cross board and the Blood Service board with two semi-separate entities. And we're planning to deliver this in mid-2020. Uh, it's very short timelines uh, for a very, very complex project. So we're doing a pilot project in Western Australia in collaboration with gastroenterologists at Fiona Stanley Hospital. We've already obtained funding from the McCusker Foundation and from HBF, the Health Fund. And we have a processing center for the blood service in Perth uh, called the Perth Processing Center. And that's where we'll be doing the actual work. And um, refurbishments are already starting for that. So we're full steam ahead. We started this project in about March. So it's going really, really quickly. Um, we're planning to deliver about 100 fecal mi microbiota transplants uh, for research in support of a clinical trial and expand from there. So I just want to clarify the term fecal microbiota transplant. There are three kind of classes of this. So fresh fecal transplants are usually done in hospital. Generally speaking, the donor is somebody that you know. It'll be somebody from your own household. And typically what happens is they get screened for disease. They donate the material and it's processed and delivered to you on the same day. And I've heard stories about this happening literally in the corner of the, uh, of the suite while the person's having a colonoscopy. Uh, the second version is what we are referring to as banked FMT. And um, indirectly, I guess, we're trying to also influence the language around this topic uh, to try and get it towards certain concepts. So this is the idea that you would have a third party uh, involved as the donor and as the manufacturer. So there's some separation between the donor and the recipient. It's like blood, tra blood, blood transfusion or blood donation. You would donate not knowing where it's going to go. And when you receive it, you won't know where it came from. You trust that to a third party to make sure that it's safe and effective. So to do that, you need some degree of separation, uh, some degree of preservation rather. So you either freeze it or freeze dry it. And then the third option is still to come. If you're a pharmaceutical manufacturer, you would what they're trying to do is develop what's called a microbial consortium 
which is a well-defined group of bacteria that may or may not have been derived from feces originally. And you get that off the shelf and it's very well-defined. You know exactly what you're putting into your patient, but that's not available at this point in time. So what we're looking at is doing stool banking. Just as a generic process, in the full version of this talk, I go into each of these uh, elements because there's a lot to talk about in each of these. It's very complex. But um, what you see there actually just coincidentally is from China. That's an automated machine that you put feces in one end and out the other end you get your fecal transplant for fresh administration. So people are looking at this seriously. Uh, we're not intending to use this device, but this is the kind of thing that's out there. So generally what you would need is you need to recruit donors Surprisingly harder than it sounds. Uh, not so much the recruitment, but the retention. If you're asking people to come in, not everybody can predict when they're going to be able to donate. <laughs> it's harder than it sounds. You know, you can't give everybody a Mentos and a Diet Coke every day and try and encourage things. So it's hard to recruit people. Most people are enthusiastic until you explain to them exactly how, you know, how many times they're going to have to come in. Um, so they then have to donate and you have to control the circumstances around that donation because we're talking now about a, a medicine. Um, you then need to process it. You need to store it. For that, you need space and equipment. Uh, you then have to perform the transplant generally outside of our setting. Obviously, that would be in a hospital setting mostly. And then after that happens, you need to monitor it. And this gets forgotten. People do studies and send people out into the world and forget that they had something. The long-term data on the effects of FMT are very slim. And unfortunately, most of the studies have been biased towards demonstrating efficacy rather than looking for problems. And without doubt, when people start looking for problems, they'll become more obvious. So I just want to give you an example. This is not from our internal material. Obviously, that's commercial in confidence at this point in time. But this is a published study from Denmark where they've outlined very well how to do fecal transplant as a bank. And I just want to point out a few things to you. So first of all, the questionnaire. Typically, you see a large number of exclusion criteria, and you can see that uh, some of these are quite hard to operationalize. A general feeling of well-being is an inclusion criterion. Uh, things like the exclusion criteria, obesity, defined as a BMI over 28, I would definitely be excluded. Uh, probably two-thirds of the Australian population would be excluded based on that. So immediately, you start seeing the problems with sufficiency. And in fact, this criterion is one of the major things that's caused problems with recruiting donors um, to date. There's a company called Open Biome in the United States who's delivered more than 40,000 FMT treatments. Uh, they screened over a four-year period 16, nearly 16,000 people, got 386 donors from that, so 3%. <coughs> and the vast majority of them were excluded because of this BMI exclusion. And the question is, what is the evidence that this is actually a problem? Depends on your application. So there are other things like comorbidities, uh, history of gastrointestinal surgery other than appendix coming out. Uh, and then some more vague ones like uh, defecation pain. I suppose that might be a, a flag of something else going wrong. But you can see a large number of exclusion criteria. Blood tests, huge number of tests here. Not just uh, infectious problems, which are the obvious ones, but also general health questions. And then microbiology tests. So this is what's done on the feces itself. And you can see a huge number of tests. Now, if you have to pay for this number of tests, you can imagine that this rapidly goes from being a very cheap and apparently effective intervention to being completely unrealistic, no matter how expensive your antibiotics are. Like if you're talking three grand a day or three grand for a treatment with fidaxomycin, suddenly it uh, starts to seem pretty cheap. So there's also some questionable choices in here, um, which, yeah, maybe in the interest of time, I'll just skip over. So some of the issues with donor screening are that first of all, you need to balance supply or sufficiency with safety. If you're too restrictive, it's very expensive. You have insufficient supply and people can't get what they need. Um, but if you're too permissive, obviously you might get a, an adverse event and we don't want to lose this as an option as a result of that, which has almost happened in the US recently. Paul didn't mention it, um, but there were two cases of invasive E. coli infections just this year in July that were reported. Uh, with ESBL producing organisms, so re resistant to third generation Kyphosporins. The FDA jumped on that, obviously, and uh, that's just been published recently, the, the details of that. And in fact, neither of those patients had recurrent C. diff. Both of them were in part of clinical trials. Um, so the key point here is that risk elimination is impossible. You can't eliminate risk. So what we have to do here is take a risk-based uh, decision-making approach, which means that you balance risk and benefit. And the way you do that varies a lot between countries um, and also even between states. And of course, if there's an outbreak that changes the calculus, it's very difficult to have a dynamic response in that kind of situation. The blood service does do this with blood, but we have a whole unit of people who constantly monitor the literature, the media, and so on, 
And I can promise you that if there's any kind of outbreak, if there's hep A in your uh, frozen berries or there's salmonella in your chicken, we know about it first. The public health people tell us. And that's the kind of infrastructure that you need to do this in real time. The other thing is that something that's not really been addressed is the risks to donors. Um, I suggested once at a meeting of people on this topic that uh, perhaps donor consent was an important thing to consider and literally got laughed out of the room for that. But in actual fact, donors in the blood industry, uh, this is something we understand very well, is that you need to look after your donors really well and you need to be very careful about <laughs> medicalizing somebody who thinks they're healthy. So if you do a test uh, in a low prevalence population, which all FMT donors by definition are healthy people, uh, you will get false positives. And you have to wonder if somebody uh, gets a false positive result, what if, I accident, what if I tell you incorrectly you've got HIV or you might have HIV? You know, that's quite a serious, quite a serious thing. Um, and in fact, uh, three people from the unit where I work at the blood service uh, wrote an article, if you're interested in that, about what actually happens when somebody gets a false positive result. So um, I'll just wrap it up then with something about regulation. So there's two regulatory bodies which you have to consider if you're a pathologist, NPAC, and if you're producing therapeutic goods, the Therapeutic Goods Administration. I'll just point out for the pathologists in the room that testing a clinical lab is a class three in vitro diagnostic device and donors actually need to be screened with class four devices and you need to have a TGA license if you do that kind of testing. Most labs are not. Also billing Medicare for FMT testing is potentially fraudulent. Uh, things like tissue banking are specifically excluded. This is arguably a form of that. And also doing a bunch of tests on a donor who sees no benefit from the results of those tests is over-servicing. So there's some serious problems with the way it's done that need to be addressed. And I'll just skip over the slide because I'm running out of time, but I just want to point out the last slide here. So the regulation was clarified in September that there are two ways to supply FMT currently. It's classed as a biological medication. So you have to meet the standards set by the TGA. We're expecting the details of the screening tests and questions that need to be applied uh, in early 2020. But as a hospital, the supervisor is the treating clinician and you need to have a quality system uh, in place. And that hasn't been defined what that means. You don't need a GMP license, but you need to register it on the therapeutic goods register. So uh, I think that's the key thing to understand is that FMT is not just another medical procedure, it's manufacture of a therapeutic good with a lot of risks and you have to balance that against the, the benefit that you expect. And it's very much a case by case basis. So, thank you.